Hello, my name is Glenn Hall. Today is October 30th, 2022. This is part three of my series called The Obedience of Faith, which is um, my teaching on the book of Romans. We are going to be starting with chapter five of Romans today, but I'm going to read a little bit from um, chapter four as we get into chapter five just to bring us uh, back up to speed with Paul's thought. Before I get into Romans, though, I want to um, remind you of a couple important scriptures. First one is from uh, Isaiah chapter 8, and I have taught a lot on this. Uh, verse 18 says, Chapter 8, verse 16. We'll start with verse 16. Bind up the law, seal, I'm sorry, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. The law and the testimony. The testimony and the law. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. We disciples are to hold to the testimony of Jesus and to the law of God. Verse 17, I will wait for I am, that's our Lord, who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob, that the house of Jacob are the believers in the one true God. And I will hope in him. Behold, I and the children whom I am has given me are signs and portents in Israel from I am of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. That's Jesus speaking there, a prophecy, and it's a prophecy that occurs in the book of Hebrews. And when they say to you, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? Well, I didn't want, I didn't plan to even mention this, but tomorrow is Halloween, and unfortunately, a lot of Christians celebrate Halloween. And um, if you do, you need to understand that that's sin. Do not exalt the things of the devil, thinking that you are doing a good thing for your children, or for yourself, or anyone else. Halloween is a time in which evil people do a lot of evil things. Of course, they do evil things all the time, but Halloween especially they look to as, an, as a time when they can work their evil upon others. Never, if you have ever gone to any type of... Um, fortune teller, palm reader, witch, warlock, ever gotten involved with any kind of satanic, black magic, white magic, anything like that. You need to repent, not do it again, and go on with God. Clearly, we should never inquire of the dead on behalf of the living. Then again, in verse 20, Isaiah 8, To the law and to the testimony. If they will not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. It is because they have no light in them. Now, I wanted to start here because now I want to go to Psalm 19 and I've been talking about that. That's really what got me interested in doing a teaching on the book of Romans because Psalm 19 verse 4 is quoted in Romans chapter 10. Now it's very interesting. The first six verses are dealing with the testimony. The heavens declare the glory of God. This is Psalm 19. 
The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. The heavens declare, they speak, the sky above proclaims. Day after day pours out speech, pours out speech from the heavens, from the sky. And night to night, the heavens, the sky reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. In other words, every language, every speech can be heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth. Whose voice? The heaven's voice. The sky's voice. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. That is the testimony of God that he gave man from the very beginning. And I want to commend this book to you. It's uh, written by E.W. Bullinger, The Witness of the Stars. You can easily find it. You can find it on Amazon. You can find it on eBay. You can get some good deals on eBay with regard to this book. Um, it is an exceptional book, and he begins it in the introduction by going to Psalm 19 because he makes the point that this the witness of the stars are the 48 constellations that are represented by the 12 zodiac signs there are 12 zodiac signs each one of those signs is a constellation, and then within each one of those, there are three more. So there's a total of 48 constellations, and they tell the story of Christ. The whole history. So I recommend that you, you get that book and you read it. So the very beginning of Psalm 19 tells us about the testimony of God that God has given us in the constellations, so he's put it in creation so that men are without excuse. But men have tried to hide it, and that's one of the reasons we have chemtrails today and why they've kept us from even looking at the stars now, but that's just one of the things they do with those evil chemtrails. Then going down to verse 7 of Psalm 19, the law of I am is perfect reviving the soul. The testimony of I am is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of I am are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of I am is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of I am is clean, enduring forever. The rules of I am are true and righteous altogether. The law, the testimony that's in the law. Moses wrote the testimony of taking Israel from Egypt, the precepts of I am, the commandment, the fear, the rules. So what do we see? We see in Psalm 19, the law and the testimony. And so this is what we need to be focusing on. We live in a time where the world is doing everything that it can to destroy our faith. And we are still in a time when God is hiding himself from us. A time when very few people are getting any kind of direct revelation, any type of direct words. Um, a lot of people are going through sickness and not being healed of diseases. So we are in a time of great pressure right now, God's people. It, it is especially a time that we need to be looking at the testimony of God and re, rebuilding our faith by things that we know are sure, like the testimony in the stars, the witness in the stars. And then, of course, knowing God's law, his rules for our behavior, which now leads us to 
the book of Romans. So Romans 4, it was, uh, we were talking about Abraham and how Abraham <clears throat> was counted as righteous by his faith. So God told Abraham that he was going to have a son. Years before he told him he was going to have a son named Isaac, he said, your offspring will be like the stars of heaven. And that's when his faith, Abraham believed God and his faith was counted to him as righteousness. And now here it is, 13 years later, God speaks to him and says, you will have a son by this time next year. You will name him Isaac. Verse 19 says this, Abraham did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old. He was 99 at this point. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words that was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but also for us. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. So, by faith, we are accounted as righteous as well. So now in chapter 5, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, just as if we had no sin, by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, and this was the propitiation, that we now have peace with God. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. That's our hope, the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. So the Christian life, you know, we've heard a lot of false gospel that says that the, uh, the name it, claim it gospel, that the Christian life is all about abundance and having all of your desires met. But that's not what Paul says. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Because you have to endure when you suffer. It's not easy. And endurance produces character, which is what God wants in us. He wants us to have a patient, godly character. And character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who he has given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. We were weak because we were totally in sin. All of us were totally in sin when we received Jesus as our Lord. But Christ died for us, for the ungodly, while we were weak. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. So, the wrath of God is turned away from us. We do not have to fear uh, the wrath of God. We do not have to fear punishment from God because God works in us to will and to do according to his good pleasure. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. So we were enemies with God. So if God reconciled us because of his son while we were enemies, now much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? Okay, so he did this for us when we were 
unworthy of anything. So now that he made us worthy because he died for us, will he not bring us through totally into salvation? More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Now, here's an interesting part. Verse 12, Romans 5, 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. So Adam was a type of Christ. The transgression he's speaking of here is that Adam was told not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so that was a law God made for him. And Adam, in fact, did eat of that tree, knowing that he was sinning when he did it. I believe that he did it in order to go be joined with his wife because Eve was deceived and she ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and um, Adam knew that he that she would die and at, he didn't probably know what that meant but I believe that he deliberately ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because they were one flesh you know, that's what God said, the two shall become one flesh. And so Adam willingly died for Eve. And I think that's why he's called a type of Christ. But it still was a sin because he was told by God not to eat of that tree. Therefore, sin came in and reigned in the world ever since then. Verse 15, but the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. Well, how many died by Adam's trespass? All men, right? So the many referred to who died by his trespass are all men. And now it says, by the grace of God and the free gift, by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. The many are the same. It's talking about his grace abounded for all men. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to the condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. This is one of the scriptures that states that there is going to be universal reconciliation. Now, does that mean that people can just go out and do what they want? As many foolishly say, universalism teaches not at all. We are held accountable and we will just see, we will see how accountable we are held to be as we go on in this book of Romans. And Paul is very clear with this. Verse 19, for as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. 
We're talking about the same group of many here. It's all. Many people became sinners through Adam's sin. All people did. Well, this says that by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. That's talking about all men. Now the law came in to increase the trespass. And we're going to talk a little bit more about what that means later. It's very interesting. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. In other words, the sin has gotten greater and greater in the world. And now we live at a time where sin is overwhelming the world. The entire world practically is caught up in debauchery today. But as sin increased, grace abounded all the more. You know, to think that Jesus will still forgive people who have indulged in the most heinous crimes and sins against humanity is unbelievable. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay, now we're going to go to chapter 6 of Romans. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Well, see, now here's, here's Paul's answer to the people who say that universalism will lead to people just living the way they want. Well, unfortunately, that's true for a lot of Christians, isn't it? People who actually say that they're Christians say that they have grace to sin. Again, Paul says this, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? In other words, do you have grace to sin? By no means, he answers. How can we who died to sin still live in it? How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. <clears throat> Many years ago, well, let me go back a little before that story. Um, 46 years ago was the time that God revealed to me that he wrote the scriptures. <clears throat> and I've told that story quite a few times. But there was a night when I was just reading, I had just been reading through the Bible for about three months, New Testament and Old Testament. And one night I saw that the person who was speaking in the Old Testament, who, who had written the Old Testament, was the same one who had been speaking in the New Testament earlier in the day that I had read. So I knew that it was the same writer, the same author. Just like if you've read uh, a lot of books by one favorite author you have, you know their style, you know what they sound like. And I said, when I realized that, I knew the Testaments. I was in Deuteronomy, I think, and I was somewhere in the New Testament. I knew that those books had been written hundreds and hundreds of years apart. And so I said to myself, this is impossible unless God wrote the Bible. And when, God, when I said those words to myself, the voice of God spoke to me and said, that's right, Glenn, and I want you to teach my word. Well, what do you think my first thought was? I, I went on and enrolled in a Bible college 
almost immediately, but that wasn't the first thing I thought. The first thing I thought was this, then I better do what it says. If God wrote the Bible, then God is God, and he said certain things are wrong, certain things are right, then I better do what? I better do what it says. That was the first thought that went through my mind. And then, so I was, I went to Bible college then, and um, was the beginning of my second year that I met my wife. We just had our 44th anniversary. We actually married, got married that um, semester of my sec first semester of my second year. But it was during that semester that I came to a, a deeper revelation of this Romans chapter 6. And I'll just read it again. What shall we say then? Are, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who die to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? What? Baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. If we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old man was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Well, I had been baptized when I was nine years old. Uh, my family went to a Disciples of Christ church. It was part of what happened when you're in fourth grade. You go through a few teachings, and so you get baptized. <clears throat> and... Um, I knew I'd been baptized and I hadn't had not thought of being baptized again but when I read this verse from Romans 6 I um, I realized you know I did not understand what I was doing when I was nine years old but I do understand this now and that um, I need to get baptized again because do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have were baptized into his death? Well, well, I need to uh, take part in that then. So then getting baptized for me then when I was 22 years old was a an act of faith where it was realizing it was by faith entering into Christ's death and dying to sin. And so, you know, I believe the, the proper way of understanding this is that it's a that's an immersive, immersive baptism that you should be immersed in water and up. But I think if you have this understanding and, and you want to be baptized and wherever you go, they sprinkle you or whatever, and you, and you believe that is your baptism, I think that's just as effective. But the point I want to make here is that if you've never understood this, then maybe you should think about getting baptized again and coming into that understanding and that real realization that you also have been baptized into the death of Jesus. Chapter 6, verse 6. We know that our old man was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. 
Why would that be? Because when you die, you can't sin anymore. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also will we believe that we will also live with him. So this, see, these are things that we do by faith. That by faith, we believe we have partaken of the death of Christ on the cross. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. But the death he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. I'm remembering something, I think it was Watchman Nee who taught that this is an accounting term like reckoning. You also must reckon yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So by faith, we, we make an entry in our accounting book. Yes, I am dead to sin. I am alive to God in Christ Jesus. It's one of these things that we do by faith. So then Paul next follows it up with this. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. And then once again, Paul says, what then? Are we to sin? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. In other words, no. What are you talking about? You cannot use your grace to sin. We have to understand that. How many of us partake in unrighteous activities thinking that we have grace to sin. Think about the television you watch. Think about the movies you watch. Think about the entertainment you go to, the plays, the shows, the party centers, the big cities, the latest fashions, the music, you listen to. Consider everything in light of the righteousness of God. So again, Romans 6, 15, what then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the, of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? So the title of this teaching is The Obedience of Faith. If you have faith, then you are going to be obedient to the rules and the ways of God. And not with, not with a, a type of legalism. See, every church has their own set of rules, all their do's and don'ts, and, and a lot of them are not based upon any scripture at all. It's simply what some leaders sometime in the past thought every good Christian boy and girl ought to do. But there is a very simple set of rules, and it's called the Ten Commandments. And you know what those are. And if you want further uh, 
elucidation of what those are, just go back to Romans chapter 1, and it wouldn't hurt us to review those again. Paul is discussing men, mankind. Verse 28, Romans 1, 28. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, how many of you gossip? Always talking about somebody. Don't you realize when you do that, you're slandering them? Why are you doing that? Because you think you're better than them? They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Okay, this gives you some idea of what the Ten Commandments tell us not to do. Again, Romans 6.16. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. Okay, this is Paul's standard of teaching. So he's commending them and saying, you have become obedient to this. And having been set free from sin, you have become slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness leading to sanctification. So become a slave to righteousness, a slave to the right commands of God. And this will lead to sanctification. Sanctification is being set apart to holy use. So by becoming a slave to righteousness, as you do that, you will then be set apart by God for his use. You will become sanctified. You will become set apart as holy for God's purposes and God's uses. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. In other words, you had nothing to do with righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, see, we are bond slaves of God now. The fruit you get leads to sanctification, being set apart for God's use, and its goal its end is eternal life, life like God's. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now clearly, these Romans were not perfect in their obedience because remember he starts the book and he blasts them for judging people who do all those things if they continue to do those things. And that's the whole point. We are not to continue to walk in sin. If we are walking in sin, we need to repent. We need to recognize the sin. We need to repent, ask for Jesus' forgiveness, turn away from the sin, and go on. You may do it again. Repent again. 
You may fall seven times. Get up every time. Repent every time. Just keep keep on repenting because Jesus is always there to forgive you so long as you will follow after him. Okay, we've now come to chapter 7. I think we're going to end here today. So I pray, Father, that you will open our eyes to see, open our ears to hear. I pray that you will wash us with your word, cleanse us with your word, give us eye salve, cleanse us, Cleanse our eyes so that we can see the truth. Fill us with your spirit so that we can walk in your way. Give us understanding of the things that we do that are still displeasing in your sight. And give us the grace and the faith to turn away from what is displeasing and to walk wholly after you, to be able to endure until the end.